I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today, we're continuing with Section 9-7 of The Incarnation of Ahriman by Rudolf Steiner. We're picking up in the middle of Lecture 3. One of the developments in which Ahriman's impulse is clearly evident is the spread of the belief that the mechanistic mathematical conceptions inaugurated by Galileo, Copernicus, and others explain what is happening in the cosmos. That is why anthroposophical spiritual science lays such stress upon the fact that spirit and soul must be discerned in the cosmos, not merely the mathematical mechanistic laws put forward by Galileo and Copernicus as if the cosmos were some huge machine. It would augur success for Ariman's temptings if people were to persist in merely calculating the revolutions of the heavenly bodies, in studying astrophysics for the sole purpose of ascertaining the material composition of the planets, an achievement of which the modern world is so proud. But it would be a grave state of affairs if this Copernicism were not confronted by the knowledge that the cosmos is permeated by soul and spirit. It is this knowledge that Ariman wants to withhold, in preparation for his early, earthly incarnation. He would like to keep people so dull that they can grasp only the mechanical aspect of astronomy. Therefore, he confirms and reinforces people's disinclination for knowledge concerning soul and spirit in the cosmos. That is only one of the forces of corruption poured by Ariman into human souls. Another means of temptation connected with his incarnation he also works in cooperation with the Luciferic forces. Another of his endeavors is to preserve the already widespread attitude that public welfare depends only on providing for the economic and material needs of humanity. <clears throat> Here we come to a point that is not willingly faced in modern life. Official science nowadays contributes nothing to real knowledge of the soul and spirit, for the methods adopted in the orthodox sciences are of value only for apprehending external nature, including the external nature of the human being. Just think with what contempt average citizens today regard anything that seems idealistic, anything that seems to be a path leading in any way to the spiritual. At heart they are always asking, what is the good of it? How will it help me to acquire the world's goods? They send their sons to grammar school, having perhaps been to one themselves. They send them on to a university or institute of advanced studies. But all this is done merely in order to provide the foundations for a career. In other words, to provide the material means of livelihood. And now think of the consequences of this. What numbers of people there are today who no longer value the spirit for the sake of the spirit and the soul for the sake of the soul? They are out to absorb from cultural life only what is regarded as useful. That is a significant and mysterious factor in the life of modern humanity, and one we should be aware of. Average citizens who work assiduously in their offices from morning till evening and then go through their habitual evening routine will not allow themselves to get mixed up with what they call the twaddle to be found in anthroposophy. It seems to them entirely redundant, for they think that is something one cannot eat. It finally comes to this though people will not admit it, that in ordinary life nothing in the way of knowledge is considered really useful unless it helps to put food in the mouth. In this connection, people today have succumbed to a strange fallacy. They do not believe that the spirit can be eaten, and yet the very ones who say this do precisely that. By refusing to accept anything spiritual, they actually devour the spiritual with every morsel that passes through the mouth into the stomach and dispatch it along a path other than the path which leads to the real well-being of mankind. I believe that many Europeans think it is the credit of their civilization to be able to say we are not cannibals, but these Europeans and their American appendage are, nonetheless, devourers of soul and spirit. The soulless devouring of material food leads to sidetracking of the spirit. It is difficult to say these things today, for in the light of such knowledge, just think what would have to be said to, of a large section of modern culture. Keeping people as devourers of the soul and spirit is one of Ariman's impulses in preparation for his incarnation. The more that people can be roused to conduct their affairs, not for material ends alone, but to regard a free and independent spiritual life as no less important than economic life, as an integral part of the social organism, the more they will be able to await Ariman's incarnation with a stance and attitude worthy of humanity. Another tendency in modern life of benefit to Ariman in preparing his incarnation is that all is so clearly in evidence in nationalism. Whatever can separate people into groups, whatever can alienate them from mutual understandings the whole world over and drive wedges between them, strengthens Ariman's impulse. 
In reality, we should recognize the voice of our Iman in what is so often proclaimed nowadays as a new ideal. Freedom of nations, even the smallest, and so forth. But blood relationship has ceased to be a decisive factor. And if this outworn notion persists, we shall be playing straight into the hands of our Iman. His interests are promoted, too, by the fact that people are taken up with the most divergent shades of party opinions, of which the one can be justified as easily as the other. A socialist party program and an anti-socialist program can be backed by arguments of equal validity. And if people fail to realize that this kind of proof is so utterly superficial that the no and the yes can both be proven equally by our modern intelligence, useful as it is for science but not for a different kind of knowledge. If people do not realize that this intelligence lies entirely on the surface, in spite of serving economic life so effectively, they will continue to apply it to social life and spiritual life as well. One group will prove one thing, another its exact opposite, and as both proofs can be shown to be equally logical, hatred and bitterness, of which there is more than enough in the world, will be intensified. These trends, too, are exploited by Ariman in preparation for his earthly nation. Again, what will be of particular advantage to him is the short-sighted narrow conception of the Gospels that is so prevalent today. You know how necessary it has become in our time to deepen understanding of the Gospels through spiritual science, but you also know how widespread is the notion that this is not fitting, that it is reprehensible to bring any real knowledge of the Spirit or of the cosmos to bear upon the Gospels. It is said that the Gospels must be taken in all simplicity, just as they stand. I am not going to raise the issue that we no longer possess the true Gospels. The translations are not faithful reproductions of the authentic Gospels, but I do not propose to go into this question now. I shall merely put before you the deeper fact, namely that no true understanding of Christ can be attained by a simple, that is, easy and comfortable perusal of the Gospels beloved by most religious denominations and sects today. At the time of the mystery of Golgotha, and for a few centuries afterwards, a conception of the real Christ was still possible because accounts handed down by tradition could be understood with the help of pagan luciferic wisdom. The wisdom. This wisdom has now disappeared. And what sects and denominations find in the Gospels does not lead people to the real Christ for whom we seek through spiritual science, but to an illusory picture, at most to a sublimated hallucination of Christ. The Gospels cannot lead to the real Christ unless they are illumined by spiritual science. Failing this illumination, the Gospels as they stand give rise to what is no more than hallucination of Christ's appearance in world history. This becomes very evident in the theology of our time. Why does modern theology so love to speak of the simple man of Nazareth and to identify the Christ with Jesus of Nazareth, whom it regards as a man only a little more exalted than other great figures of history? It is because the possibility of finding the real Christ has been lost, and because what people glean from the Gospels leads to hallucination, to a kind of illusion. An illusory conception of Christ is all that can be gleaned through the way in which the Gospels are read today, not the reality of Christ. In a certain sense, this has actually dawned on the theologians, and many of them are now describing Paul's experience on the way to Damascus as a mere vision. They've come to the point of realizing that their way of studying the Gospels can lead only to a vision, to a hallucination. I'm not saying that this vision is false or untrue, but that it is merely an inner experience, unconnected with the reality of the Christ being. I do not use the word hallucination with an implication of falsity, but I wish only to stress that the Christ being is here a subjective inner experience of the same character as hallucination. If people were to go no further than this, not pressing onto the real Christ but contenting themselves with the hallucination of Christ, Ariman's aims would be immeasurably advanced. The influence of the Gospels also leads to hallucinations when one Gospel alone is taken as the basis of belief. Truth to tell, this principle has been forestalled by the fact that we have been given four Gospels, representing four different aspects, and it does not do to take each single Gospel word for word on its own when outwardly there are obvious contradictions. To take one single Gospel word for word and disregard the other three is actually dangerous. What you find in sects whose adherents swear by the literal content of the Gospel of St. Luke alone or that of St. John alone is an illusory conception arising from a certain dimming of consciousness. With the dimming of consciousness that inevitably occurs when the deeper content of the Gospels is not revealed, people would fall wholly into Ariman's service, helping in a most effective way to prepare for his incarnation and adopting towards him the very attitude he desires. And now another uncomfortable truth for humankind today. 
living in the bosom of their creeds and denominations, people say, we do not need anthroposophy or anything of the kind. We are content with the Gospels in all their simplicity. They insist that this is said out of humility. In reality, however, it is of greatest arrogance, for it means that such per per persons making use of ideas with which they have been imbued through birth and which surge out of their blood think it right to dismiss the deeper treasures of wisdom so we discovered in the Gospels. These humblest of human beings are generally the most arrogant of all, especially in the domain of religion. The point to remember is, however, that the people who do most to prepare for the incarnation of Ariamon are for those who constantly preach. All that is required is to read the Gospels literally, word for word, nothing more than that. Strange to say, in spite of the radical differences, the two parties play into each other's hands. Those whom I call devourers of soul and spirit and those who demand the literal word-for-word -word reading of the Gospels. Each party plays into the hands of the other, furthering the preparation of Ariman's incarnation. For if the materialistic outlook of the devourers of soul and spirit on the one hand and that of professed Christians who refuse to enter into the deeper truths of the Gospels on the other were to win the day, then Ariman would be able to make all human beings on the earth his own. A good deal of what is spreading in external Christianity today is a preparation for Ariman's incarnation. And in many things which arrogantly claim to represent true belief, we should recognize the preparation for Ariman's work. Thus concludes section 97 of The Incarnation of Ariman by Rudolf Steiner. Next week, we will continue by picking up in lecture 3 again with section 98. I will see you then. Alam.